Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage former commander of US Cyber Command and former director of the National Security Agency and current president and CEO of IronNet Cybersecurity, General Kate Alexander. Well, it's interesting. The previous speakers took most of my notes. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for that talk. Ambassador Freed, an honor to be here again with you. And Damon, thanks for setting all of this up. Um, you know, it's interesting. Cyber has been my life, and I know several other people's lives. And one of the reasons that I'm here today is because the role Poland played in Enigma in World War II. And I want to talk about that for a few for a few hours. And then for the next couple hours, a little bit about cybersecurity. I do have a sense of humor, so please stay with me. <clears throat> Actually, I am going to talk about technology. I'm going to talk about the threats. And I'm going to talk about a path forward, what I see as a path forward for nations to take in cybersecurity. You know, today it seems as an intractable problem when we look at cyber. People think this is something that we can't handle. There are so many different elements going on. It's changing so rapidly. And I think back to World War II and to Enigma. Uh, I first found out about Enigma when I became the director of NSA, the details of Enigma. And one of our uh, historians, Patrick Whedon, came up and briefed me on Enigma and the importance of Enigma to cryptography and to the actual uh, development of NSA, because NSA was born out of the cryptography of World War II. And you see what's publicly made available. He said, well, wait, here's the facts. The people who broke Enigma were three Polish mathematicians, uh, Rajewski, Zygalski, and Wojcicki. Those three did something that everybody thought was impossible. At the time, the Enigma system had 3 times 10 to the 114th power. That's the number of combinations. And everybody thought this could not be broken. When it was revealed in 1970s, the Germans were just stunned that somebody had broken what they thought was unbreakable. And it was through the brilliance of these mathematicians and their perseverance that broke that system. And it shows us that today's uh, cyber networks and the cryptology that goes with them and everything that's there is based on mathematics. And Poland is a center of mathematical prowess. So it's an honor to be here and to first say thanks. Thanks for what you and your people did to help stop World War II. Because in World War II, there were between 70 and 85 million people killed globally. When you look at the population of the world, that's a few percent of our, our population killed during World War II. Even if that didn't stop the war, it greatly curtailed it. And millions of people owe their lives to Poland today. I look at the war in the Atlantic and the number of submarines that were shooting down our ships. If it weren't for Enigma, much of those materials would never have made it to Europe. And the war would have gone on and on. So that's the start. It's interesting now to see where this digital uh, race has come out of World War II. Now I look at my father served in the Pacific in World War II. And you think about what that generation did, what the World War II generation did for our country it was the space program. You think about putting a man on the moon. It was the introduction of semiconductors and computers and then the internet. And here we are. This is the greatest time, I think, in history when you look at exponential changes. And that technology continues to grow. The amount of unique information that, was, that is created this year is more than the last 5,000 years combined. We live in exponential times. And if you, if you write it out, it's in zettabytes, about 20 zettabytes. 
That's 20 with 21 zeros after it. That's the amount of unique information that will be created this year. And if you think about that change and what that means, the change in the way we push data through networks is changing as well. If you think about an Apple Airport time capsule, that has three terabytes of information. That's three times 10 to the 12th power. And you think about that information going on to the internet. In 1998, just 20 years ago, that would take for us to push that over a 56.6K modem, 13.6 years. Today it's gonna to be done in seconds. Think of that, 13.6 years, just 20 years ago, to seconds. The top 10 in-demand jobs now in the United States didn't exist in 2007. That's people who write applications for Apple, for the new Apple, Samsung, cloud, all these new jobs that are being created out of this economy. And I think this conference highlights that when you think about a cyber, uh, a cyber state initiative and what we can do, what we collectively can do, and what that means for jobs. You know, I have uh, 16 grandchildren. I know I don't look that old, thank you. Um, and when I look at what they're doing and where they're going to school, you think about what they learned their first year in college. In two years, half of that will be outdated. That means for the universities, and Professor Sermon, I know he's doing stuff with your cryptologic school. If you think about what that means, that means half of what we learn in two years will be outdated. Or more importantly, it means what we're doing today is we're teaching kids in school about technology that hasn't been created, on jobs that haven't been made, to solve problems we don't even know are problems. That's the rate of change. Now here's, here's the, the big set of impacts. This has tremendous opportunities for the world. This network and the data that we create will help us solve cancer, Alzheimer's, and all these diseases. We need the data, we'll create the models, but when you think about it, it has tremendous opportunities. I was on stage with some of the senior folks at IBM, and they were talking about Watson. Watson is a, uh, a system that they built. First, it took on the best uh, uh, players in uh, some of our games in the States and beat them. And when you think about that, you'd say, wow, a machine just beat people in jeopardy. Well, that's a, a game and kind of a gimmick. What they did is they turned it to cancer. If you're diagnosed with brain cancer, they give you 15, 14 months to live, plus or minus two months. And part of the problem is diagnosing the chemotherapy and radiation treatment for your type of cancer. And it takes five doctors about 30 days to go through that. With Watson, they can do it in nine minutes we will solve cancer with the capabilities we now have in this network. I believe that in our lifetime, we just wanna live a little bit longer, but in our lifetime, we'll solve cancer. Think about that. Great opportunities and great vulnerabilities. I wanna turn now to those vulnerabilities and the threats because as the prime minister mentioned, we live in historic times once again, it was out of World War I that Poland was born and these great mathematicians came. And I see very similar things going on in the region today. And that's with the disinformation and the cyber attacks that are going on here. And one of the reasons that we need to work together. If you think about 2007 when the Apple uh, iPhone first came out, it was also the same time of the attack on uh, Estonia. When Estonian people pushed over the Stalin monument, they were hit with a series of disruptive attacks from Russia. And if you go to 2008, Georgia was invaded by Russia, and at the same time, Russian hackers hit Georgia banks and Georgia government, exactly at the same time. Called Russian hackers, 
I think that's also known as FSB, but Russian hackers. And you think about these attacks. In 2008, I had been the director now for three years at NSA, and um, we noticed some sensitive DOD information in networks where they shouldn't have been. We're the good guys, so what we do is good, what they do is bad, I get the irony. But when you think about it, we went down and uh, talked to the folks at that network. They wouldn't let us in. NSA was not authorized to be in at that time. You had to be invited in. And um, after seven days, we got to come in, and we found 1,500 beacons or 1,500 pieces of malware that were on the Secretary of Defense's internal network, a classified network. Uh, five guys came to my office on Friday, the 24th of October at 1630. I'm sure it's the same here in government. All bad things happen on Friday afternoon to screw up your weekends. Same thing in the U.S. And these guys came in and said, we've got a problem. I said, I know it's Friday afternoon. You're here to screw up my weekend. And they said, we're here for you. And uh, they explained what they had found. I called Secretary Gates and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and explained that problem. But the more interesting part is when I turned around and sat down with these five guys, I said, since we found this problem, how are we going to solve it? Now, it was not NSA's job to solve it, but we had the best technical talent. And they came up with the idea of building a new system with decryption capabilities, solving that problem in a unique way. And my job as a general officer was to figure out how long it would take. Now, I had a great saying, nothing is too hard for those of us who don't have to do it. I didn't have to do this. I figured it didn't have to be that hard. How about we have it done by tomorrow? And they did. 22 hours later, it was up on the network, a new system built overnight. And at that time, nobody else in the world could have done that. That one key point was what caused the creation of U.S. Cyber Command. When Secretary Gates and the President, then President Bush, saw that that group of people could solve that problem, he decided to put those together under that leadership. So it's interesting that an attack later revealed to be out of Russia caused the creation of U.S. Cyber Command. Thank you. That part was good. If you go on and you think about the attacks going from disruptive and stealing a property to destructive, in 2012, we had Saudi Aramco hit with a set of destructive virus, uh, uh, wiper viruses. What that did is destroyed the data on over 30,000 systems. That attack the next week was focused on the U.S. financial system, a disruptive attack. A week later, it also hit Gutter and destroyed over 30,000 systems in Gutter and RAS gas. And you now see these continuing to go. At the same time, you're seeing these sets of attacks go on. We see the theft of intellectual property. That theft of intellectual property, in my mind, is the greatest transfer of wealth in history. And it's predominantly done by China. And we saw this transfer of wealth going from our defense industrial base and from our technical folks. In fact, Cisco, who has a presence here, I understand, lost a lot of their information to a company that would uh, be later become Huawei. And that was revealed in court. The source code stolen from Cisco was used to start Huawei. Uh, so this has a big impact. That theft of intellectual property is the future for our children and our grandchildren. Gone. And we have, on the other hand, we have this disruptive set of attacks going on. And you see that cyber is being used as an element of national power. Nation states, Russia, Iran, China, and others are using it as an element of national power. That means that we are going to be attacked when they disagree with us. 
whether it's our political realm, and we saw that in the elections, or our military realm, or economically. Cyber is an element of national power. So we have this problem. Uh, and I did, uh, I described this to our Congress, and you have to have a sense of humor in dealing with Congress, uh, and uh, t uh, Tom Bossert knows this. Uh, one of the congressional members actually said to me, why don't we outlaw the internet? And I thought, you probably don't want to say that to your constituents since you're from California. <laughs> this is probably not going to go well. Um, and uh, that person did not. So what do we do? How do we solve this problem? <clears throat> Let me describe how we do it today. And then let's think back to what those three brilliant mathematicians did in setting us up for World War II to solve those problems. And here's the issues as I see it. Today, on our networks and the way we set this up, we have a known set of threats that we face. And with those known sets of threats, we create signatures to stop those. And every company does their own. So if every person here was a company, each of you would protect your own company from these signatures, and you would buy commercial capabilities, and government would do the same. And so we all have our signatures, and we look with those signatures to see if any of that is coming into our network or on our endpoint, on our devices. And if it's not, we assume we're OK, only to find out that something got by. It got by because it was new or because we didn't patch a vulnerability and made a mistake, uh, or there is a human error. People make mistakes. And we can train people, but it's my experience running large organizations, no matter what you do, uh, running a large organization, somebody will make a mistake. They will click on a file they shouldn't have. And you can point it out after the fact, you shouldn't have done this, and they will be very sorry but they made a mistake. So our system has these, our cybersecurity system has those three elements today. We develop signatures of what we know. How do we know it? Well, somebody had to get attacked. You had to defend it, uh, detect it in your network. You had to create the indicators of compromise and a set of signatures. Then that's passed out to everybody and now you're safe again. Now, Let's look at it from the threat side, the offense. This is a great place for the offense. Why is that? The offense is always successful. You have three ways of getting in. They have signatures. They have people that are trained. And you have vulnerabilities in your system. You can do any one of those three to get into a network. And all three of them are used by adversaries to get in. And once in, it's hard on the outside but once they're in, they're free to roam around. It's like going through airport security. Once you get in, you can go any place in the airport. And once they're in the network, essentially they can go any place. Unless a system administrator or one of your cyber analysts is really paying attention and seeing an anomaly. And a good adversary will track those people to ensure they are not seen. So we have a problem. And if we continue to go this route, we're going to continue to have issues. So there are two sets of things that I think we need to do. First, for companies, and I say this on the commercial side, is that we have to look at how we defend a network on the commercial side, a bank. And so uh, for, thank you for co-hosting this, uh, this conference today. And when you think about securing your bank, you think about all those points that I just put out. But the reality is you need some way to see movement, to actually visualize what's going on in your network in order to defend it. And that's behavioral analytics. In my mind, that's the future. But it's very hard. Uh, I had the opportunity to co-write some patents, uh, six patents, uh, three while I was in government. Now, why would I write patents? That's what I asked these guys. I said, why do you want me to write a patent? And they said, well, you have all these ideas. If you don't patent it, 
somebody else will patent it and then you'll have to pay for your idea. And I said, well, that's not right. And they said, well, if you don't like that, write a patent. So we wrote patents. Now, I am embarrassed to say that on the front page of my first patent, I said behavioral analytics will not work because of all these problems. So we have to do this. The reality is they will work if you solve these problems. So behavioral analytics is a way of looking at the network. And the reason I bring that up here, while it's somewhat technical, if you think about it, what's behavioral analytics based on? Math. Mathematics data science. In fact, one of our best data scientists are here today. She was born in Poland, Anna, Anya, and uh, it shows you what brilliant people can do in this area. So you need behavioral analytics to see the anomalies in your network. But there's more. There's more you can and should do. Today, every one of you, if you were a business, would be defending yourself. And you would share what you know once you find it. But you only share what you know when you get hacked. And normally after your lawyers and your C-suite your folks said, reputationally it's OK and liability-wise we're OK, so now we can share. And that's normally way too late. In the US, way too late to share sensitive information. So in behavioral analytics, what you want to do is share anomalies at network speed. And think about if this whole group here is all banks and you now have anomaly detection, you may not be able to prove that the first part is malware, but by sharing that information, just the threat information, not personally identifiable information, you begin to protect a whole sector. And you could do the same for financial, for energy, for healthcare, for government. And if you did that, you could share it not only with the sector, but you could share it with the government. And this is the key point that I brought out to both President Bush and President Obama. Our job was to defend the nation in cyber. But if you can't see the attacks, our defense is actually incident response. And incident response means you get hacked, you lose all your stuff, and everything goes bad. Um, and so uh, imagine you're the CEO of Sony and they got hacked, they got all, lost all their data. The government comes out and says, you got hacked. They said, we know we got hacked. You lost all your data. We know we lost all our data. You're probably going to lose your job. We know we're going to lose our job. We're the government. We're here to help you. That's no help. What they wanted was they wanted us to stop the attack. Now, there's two issues that come out of this. Does Sony fire back on North Korea? I am convinced that if we take some of your folks and ours, all civilian, and put them at Sony, we could attack back and destroy those seven computers in North Korea. They may have eight. That's a joke. I'm sorry. I'll work on that delivery. <clears throat> but we could take that down. But North Korea would assume that that was the US or South Korea and start of a conflict. And they would start artillery into Seoul. So a counterattack by Sony could result in a war on the Korean Peninsula. And that is an inherently government responsibility. So <clears throat> in our world, companies can't attack back. And if they can't attack back, then it's the government's responsibility. We had this argument with all of Congress, a lot of it, and Tom Bossert was in uh, much of this. And I told him, I said, the same, the same scenario. If you won't allow a bank or Sony or Target to attack back, then it's the government's responsibility. And they went on and on, and I was always asked, have you read the Constitution? Yes, I've read the Constitution. And I would pull it out and read the preamble. And in the preamble, it says, for the common defense. We create governments for the common defense. That's why we're here. That's why we're there. For the common defense. And 
that common defense in our mind was the government getting information back and responding as necessary, not commercial entities. So we have to work together. It's not the government taking over the networks. It's the government getting information from banks and others that they're being attacked so the government can help respond to that. I believe that's the future of cybersecurity. And then there's another key part to this. If we do it right, we can create a collective security, not just for a nation, but for allies. Why is Poland so important to the United States and to Europe? You are the foundation for stability in Eastern Europe. What you do here matters to the rest of Europe and to the world. And you have the capability to help set up, not just for Poland, but for the Baltic states and others, a much better collective security program in cyber that can help stop much of the attacks that are going on. And we learned in World War too, that we could not do this ourselves. We can't defend cyberspace by ourselves. We have to work together. And what I saw in that first story when I took over at NSA was the importance of working with our allies. And it's important to us today. And the best story and the best historical thing that I got as director of NSA was what those three brilliant mathematicians did. And so the reason I'm here is you have the technical talent and we can and should partner together to help solve this problem. Mr. Prime Minister, it's an honor to be here, so thank you very much. Prime Minister, we would like to thank you very much for your presence and opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay in your seat as Prime Minister departs the venue.